Good morning. Oh, I came all the way from the United States to this wonderful Smart City Expo, and I'd like to again say good morning to everybody. Good morning. That's more like it. I'm so excited to be here. I am Dr. Nicole Turner Lee. I come to you as a, a fellow from the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. Uh, this is my first time to the Congress, and so I'm appreciative of them of actually extending this invitation. And I'm actually very thankful for all of you who have taken your time today to actually participate in this session. This session is going to be interesting, and I'm going to tell you why. How many of you, just raise your hand, were around when we had essentially what I call no G's? <laughs> Zero G's. That time I think we had what were called these pagers or beepers that we carried around that were in these little boxes. And then we quickly went to, I think, what was then considered 2G. Anybody around with 2G? 3G? 4G, which is what we have now, and now we're going into this revolution of 5G. Let me tell you why that's important. I just recently wrote a paper on this that is available at the Brookings Institutional website. What we saw with the innovation of 4G was essentially things like social media platforms as well as ride-sharing services. What we have the potential to see with the evolution of 5G will be this actual specificity where we will see enterprise-based uh, applications and services right across those networks. We are at a stage right now, and I was speaking to some of our panelists that you will hear from today, where the capacity that we have to actually bring what consumers now demand when it comes to technological resources, the infrastructure needs to be improved. And in the United States, we're working very hard to do that. It's not an easy process, and I know that I'm speaking to many of you in this audience that have gone through challenges from both a regulatory perspective, a federal perspective, and a civil society perspective. But without the evolution of 5G, we may not see the enablement of Internet of Things and other tools and resources that we have never imagined. I'm not going to tell you my age, but I shared with some of the panelists there were two shows that I particularly liked coming home to every day when I was a kid. One of those shows was called The Jetsons. The United States, that was a Jetson guy, had a spaceship as a car. His wife had a closet that was all simulated in terms of her outfits. I don't even think their kids were real <laughs> in that show. And I used to watch this other show called The Flintstones. And in The Flintstones, Fred Flintstone used to ride on a car that was made of rock. And in those homes, it was actually concrete stone and not what we see today. I would suggest to all of you that Jetsons have survived and the Flintstones have died. And as we look at this evolution of technology, I am in no way saying that communities will fall apart or be obliterated because of the technology advancements. What I'm suggesting as you listen to this panel is that we no longer live in an analog society. The digital communities in which we've created, the smart, intelligent cities that are now riding off of infrastructure, IoT, cloud-based cloud software and other applications, are going to transform how communities live, learn, earn, even love. And as communities, it's imperative that they have leaders like yourself that are in front of the movement. I tell people in the United States all the time, don't be smart in one city and dumb in the other, because what you run the risk of is foreclosing on opportunities for people. I'm writing a book right now, and I'll begin to wrap up and introduce the first speaker, which is on the U.S. digital divide. And I've had this opportunity in my research at Brookings to not only look at seven cities across the U.S., but I've had the ability to, in the last 30 to 60 days, visit China, Latin America, Switzerland, and other places. We have a global problem of digital inclusion. And this global problem of digital inclusion is not just only set aside for the underprivileged and the low income and the citizens that live on the margin or edges of our society. The global underclass are now small farmers who live in the distance of new technology. Entrepreneurs and startups that do not have the opportunity to benefit from new platforms. The new underclass are legislative leaders who cannot bring their communities into the 21st century simply because they lack access to high-speed broadband. That is our new digital divide, my friends. 
And in this conversation that we have today on Smart Cities, let's think about how it's inclusive, collaborative, highly innovative, and where we work together to create communities that will no longer be in the despair of analog realities, but rather be on the cutting edge and on the right side of history when it comes to new digital technologies. And so I'm really, really excited to actually kick off this panel. I think you can tell I'm a little bit uh, uh, enthusiastic and committed and energized on this. Some of my friends consider me to be a new form of a preacher, but I'm not ordained. <laughs> I'm just here to actually spread the word about the use of technology for all communities all over wherever they live. So I want to start with our first speaker because how this day will be organized in terms of our session is that we're going to hear from a keynote uh, expert who's going to come up in just a moment and I'll introduce him formally. He will then be followed by a one-on-one -on -one conversation that I will have with the mayor of Dublin. When we're done with both of those sessions, I'd like you to parking lot your questions because we have mics in the center for you to actually ask them. We'll take a quick break so everybody can do a stretch and then we'll come back and we'll finish up with a panel which will be moderated by one of my colleagues from the United States of experts that will begin to talk more about this topic. So put your seatbelts on and get ready because we're about to talk about the future of 5G. Let me bring up my first panelist, my first keynote, who's actually going to address us. Mr. Ricardo Posta is this, got a, I forgot my glasses. That's one thing 5G hasn't solved. <laughs> it's my ability to read stuff without my glasses. He is the business and innovation manager for City Nervous System, an organic approach to city management. Let's bring them on up. I'm going to actually skip the introductions because I believe they're in your book, and let's bring them up to talk. Come on up. <laughs> I left my glasses thank there. Thank you very much. Let me give you a call. Yeah, I thank you very much, Doc, <laughs> Dr. Nicole Turner Lee, for this uh, warm introduction. I think she set the bar a bit too high, actually, when she called me a keynote expert. Um, to be honest, I'm a bit nervous. It was a long time ago that I've been in front of such an audience. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago, this friend of mine said to me, you know, let me give you a piece of advice. If you're nervous on stage, just imagine everybody naked. Well, it's not helping, actually. It's very distracting. So I'm just going to close my eyes for a while. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so I'm here to talk about, yeah, uh, the nervous system. So body, nervous system. Everybody has one. But first, let me get just a sense of the audience. Who here is an engineer? Please raise your hand. Whoa, nice. Designers, are there any designers in the room? Nah, okay, two, three, yeah, yeah. Journalists, two journalists, okay. Don't, don't be too hard on me, okay, journalists, thank you. Policy makers, politicians. Policy makers slash politicians, both. Come on, let's include them all in the same bag. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I think I see approximately what kind of audience I have. Where's my pointer, by the way? Oh, I think I forgot it. Oh, yeah, sorry. So, um, let me give you a little overview about you know, smart cities evolution. So imagine how it was in the Middle Ages. Obviously, no smart cities, you know. Cities were small. Uh, most of the people were living in rural areas. So city management was pretty kind of easy. So imagine waste management, you know, like, you would go there as a citizen, so, excuse me, sir, where's the glass? No, that's the other side of the river. But throw it on the river, yeah, but the other side, you know. What about food scrapes? Well, it's this, this side here, you know, food scrapes. So it wasn't very uh, uh, complicated, you know. But then uh, a lot of new uh, technologies appeared, you know, coal, uh, trains, cars, industrialization. So cities started to grow exponentially, you know. Complexity increased, increased really a lot. Um, by the way, I'm sorry, could I see my speaker notes, please? Excuse me, people from AV, <laughs> I don't see my speaker notes. I could do it without it, but it would help. <laughs> the speaker notes, please. Oh, on that side, so I cannot walk. <laughs> okay, well, anyway, I'm going to try to walk a little bit, and sometimes I'll be back. I'm sorry about that. It's not easy, you know, to remember all that, all that talk. Um, yeah, anyway, so... Technology has appeared, you know, and communication-wise, we had, you know, Morse code, telegram, phones appearing, radio, TVs, but when they appeared, 
it was really, really expensive and actually inaccessible to common people. You know, who would have a phone when it just got out? Does anybody remember the mobile phone from the 80s or 90s, beginning of the 90s? You know, probably like in a suitcase, going around, very expensive. Communications were very expensive. But then, with massification, with the massification of the use of these technologies, it got cheaper. People were able to purchase one, to communicate, to call. So city management actually had other channels which they could use to communicate with their citizens, you know, like phone. So before smart cities, I mean, in small towns, the mayor would probably see everything, you know, he would know everything, people would talk to him uh, personally, but in big towns, you couldn't have the mayor, you know, waiting for every citizen to come by and tell them their problems, what's happening in the neighborhood. So you had phones, you know, sometimes waiting hours in line in order to be able to speak with the city. But then, digitization came and the appearance of sensors. So the first generation of smart, e smart cities appeared, you know, but this first generation of smart cities has vertical silos in both data and infrastructure. So what does it mean? So it means, for example, that, you know, let's say you are from environment management. So the data from environment would go to, let's say, energy or mobility and say, hey, look, I, um, I'd like to correlate some data between air quality and the traffic. Yeah, but mobility was, uh, désolé, moi je parle pas anglais, hein. non, non, moi, que français ici. Okay, so uh, what about you, energy? No, no, you know, you know, you English, so it's like it's all Espanol. Okay, so they couldn't communicate, so everything was just separated. But then we had another layer coming, and that layer, that layer of an integrator, you know, open standards started to appear, so people or the silos started to speak the same language. But there was still a problem, they needed to translate, they needed an integrator, you know. So the guy from environment would go to energy, man, let's, you know, cooperate, let's co correlate some data. Uh, sorry, uh, I don't speak uh, with you. Yeah, but do speak English, right? Yes, yes, but uh, I saw you making fun of my accent there, huh, with your friends. I saw you. No, man, we were, I saw you, I saw you, I swear. So, okay, what about you, mobility? Eh, no, no, eh, you also made fun of my accent, I saw you, eh? Okay, okay. So, what's, what's next then, you know? What's next? Um, you know, UBWare is a research and innovation company. So basically what we do is we take new technologies that come in and we start ideating, thinking, what can we do with it, you know? In what kind of sectors and industries can we apply it? What kind of use cases and business models can come out of it? And what I want to do with you now is a really, really small exercise. And I know it's going to take a lot, but I'm going to ask you all to trust me and please close your eyes for a minute. Can you do that? Please? Close your eyes for a minute. No peeking. I see you. No peeking, please. OK. Thank you. Thank you very much for trusting me. So I want you all to picture you know, a city inside your body. So now you have cars, buses, metros, trams, scooters, bikes, all of them flowing through your veins and arteries. Your muscles are providing the power you need to move. Your lungs are the sensors and cleaners of the air you breathe. Firefighters and public authorities monitoring and protecting your body from external threats, you know, hospitals, hospitals treating your wounds, acting, all of them acting as the immune system. Now, imagine that, you know, in your body. Imagine that having a city doing that. Okay, for the ones that are still awake, please open your eyes. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you very much for imagining that, for doing that. I know it takes a lot to trust. Um, so yeah, imagine just moving a small inch of your finger. Can you imagine what it takes, you know, all the information that goes through your body to do that? You need oxygen, you know, to provide oxygen to your muscles, to your blood cells. You need blood flowing. You need actually a lot, a lot of small elements moving in order to just do that. It seems so easy, but it's very, very complicated, actually. And it takes a lot of communication, you know? And basically, this is how we envision things. So the nervous system is comprised of the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system is basically your spinal cord, yes, and your brain. 
and the peripheral nervous system is all the nerves all around it. You know, and they all communicate with each other all the time, sending signals, sending signals, sending signals. And when they get on the top of the spinal cord, on the brain, the beginning of the brain, you have the brain stem. And the brain stem is actually responsible for uh, actually coordinating all your involuntary, involuntary movements and functions. So the breathing, heart beating, something we don't think about, you know. And this is how we envision it. The city being managed, you know, all the operational stuff being automated so that city can actually uh, focus on the important things. You know, so how does that look? Actually, you get a new layer of intelligence on the edge of the infrastructure, allowing for all the departments to speak the same language without accents. You know, so now, both environment, energy, mobility, they would speak English, parler français, hablar espanol, falar portugués, Nederlands spreken ook, Deutsch sprechen, alles, everything, you know. And this really, really allows us to think, OK, with 5G now, we are able to automate all these functions you know, and really focus on what matters. So how does this look you know, like, uh, objectively? Because yeah, it's very beautiful, Ricardo speaking like that. Yeah, OK, how does this look? So you, you know, we've been working with um, many different cities, uh, mostly in Portugal, but also around Europe. And there are many cities that are protected by UNESCO. You know, so especially in the city center, you cannot go there and add IoT devices everywhere. You know, like a camera here, a sensor there. That's not how it works, because they are not allowed to change their landscape. So what do we do? We integrate you know, all these devices into existing infrastructure. So this is just an example of, for example, a lamppost, because you know, every city has a lamppost, in which you can integrate you know, 5G cell, CCTV, uh, uh, sensors, if you want to add an air sensor, a noise sensor, whatever. And this would act as a peripheral nervous system. As of the central nervous system, would be an integrator of all that data and managing all these functions, the involuntary functions. So imagine. Imagine the following use cases, you know. You have a fire somewhere that is reported. You know, you don't need city management to call the fire department. You could automate that. You could have like an AI, for example. Okay, another word, AI, yeah, yeah, I love putting words. <laughs> uh, anyway, you could have an AI verify indeed there's a fire and then send out an alert to fire to the fire department in order for them to go there. Uh, you have a breach in the power grid, okay. Alert, alert. Energy company goes there, fixes it. You know, so that city can really focus on what matters. And what matters is through data they have, historical data, looking, you know, sustainable indicators, life quality indicators, they could really focus on what matters. And what matters is policy making in order to improve citizens' quality of life. You know? So basically this is this is our vision on and we're not talking about, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. We, we've been thinking about that for three, four years now. And I'm not going to talk about that. It's just, you know, leaving this in the air. So what's next? Can we have an AI, for example, managing and doing the city management for ourselves so that people such as <laughs> Ness <laughs> would be almost, <laughs> uh, um, yeah, sorry about that, <laughs> but uh, we, couldn't, we wouldn't need you anymore. But that's something for the future, and I hope it won't happen in the next 10 years, so you could still, you know, <laughs> work. Um, but yeah, I remember, like, a lot of people are looking at AI and other technologies like, oh, no, man, that's too scary. No, no, not going to use that. I remember the first mobile phone I had before, you know, like, mobile phone, why would I need that? Smartphone, why would I need that? And now, everybody uses them, you know. Social media, why would I need that? Well, actually, I still don't use that. I'm a bit paranoid, to be honest. But uh, I'm sure I'm going to be using that in the near future. Uh, I think it was last month or something like that. I had a date with this girl. Yes, I know. I had a date. And uh, she asked me, so you don't have social, no Instagram, no Facebook? No, no, no. no. How do I know you exist? Uh, 
hi, hi, you know. <laughs> I remember that time when I was a kid also, I was going with my, my parents to the Portuguese consulate, I'm Portuguese by the way, Portuguese consulate, and um, they, were, they were trying to get me a passport, something like that, I don't remember, and they were asking for my birth certificate. So I said, hey, so hello, I, I, I was born, I'm here, you know, I couldn't understand that as a kid. Now I understand why you need a birth certificate, etc. but uh, yeah. Anyway, so that, that was a little pitch I had, uh, and this is about our vision, you know, of how we could manage the city organically as a nervous system. Um, we're at booth 449. Uh, these are some of the institu institutional sorry, partners we have, um, and the alliances. Um, we are in many different groups uh, of the European Commission, for example. Uh, to cite one example, uh, Ricardo Vitorino, a colleague of mine, is vice chairman of the ETSI cross-cutting cross context management, basically setting the standards for uh, open standards for communication between systems. Um, and if you'd like to have a chat about the future or the present, please join us at uh, booth uh, D449. My name is Ricardo Poeta, by the way. I know it's dif difficult to... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, thank you very much for your time. So at this time, we're going to entertain any questions that you may have for Ricardo. So if there are any questions, I'll just ask that you go to the mic right here and uh, shoot away. This, uh, there's this Chinese proverb that says, uh, don't uh, um, ask a question, be dumb for five minutes. Don't ask a question, be dumb your whole life. So if you have questions, please ask them. Oh, yes, I love that. We have okay. questions there. Okay, if you can come right up to the mic since we're recording, okay? Thank you so much. Don't be too harsh on me, please. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a few more minutes. If you have a question, I just encourage you to come on up. And if you don't want to ask your question here, but you have a comment, there's always the internet. So please uh, tweet your response and use our hashtag for the conference. I try not to be too harsh with you. Thank you. <laughs> Katrin here in the German Broadband Association. I have a question coming back to your nervous system uh, comparison with 5G cities. Where do you see the fiber networks in these 5G cities? Because when we talk about 5G, we quite often only talk about the mobile component. But what about the fiber, the high connectivity fiber networks? that could be maybe the veins or, yes, where do you see them? Yes, so basically, if I understand, can I, can I have the, the slide back, please? Um, so basically, if I understand your question, thank you, by the way, um, it, you're asking me if I establish a parallel between the body and the firewall network, where do I see that, okay? Can I get the slides back? Well, anyway, I can just tell you. So, <laughs> So imagine uh, the spinal cord, you know, the spinal cord which is also responsible for bringing all the nerves and uh, transmitting or transporting all the signals uh, in the body. So this, is, this would be. So it's part of the central nervous system. Does that answer your question? It's Thank you. Ricardo, it's back too. Did you want to show that slide? Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> okay. I think I explained pretty clearly, but yeah. Perfect. Okay, another question? Okay, if you can go over to the mic, it would be greatly appreciated. <laughs> Say your name and your affiliation. Okay. My name is Javier de la Plaza from Madrid. I am responsible for the Engineering Spanish Initiative Committee. So I am very happy because exactly what you are presenting just now was my vision in the 2010, more or less. So I am very happy today. <laughs> the point is, the question is, how to create a smart spot around the uh, lamppost in order to uh, control all what is happening around the uh, lamp spot and in particular for traffic applications and many other applications for a, security. Do you have a specific in, use case that I could relate yeah, to? Yeah, I have a specific use case in order to, to develop an R&D project. But in particular, the main uh, issue is how to create a full artificial intelligence and in, uh, artificial vision around the lamppost for any, any application because it's not particular, it's not only applicable to a single use case, but that may be applicable for many different uh, orientations within the, the city. 
Okay, do I understand correctly that you would like, uh, from a smart lamppost, from, from a lamppost, you would like to be able to monitor everything that goes around? Yeah, it's just to create a smart, a smart spot around the lamp, lamppost. So, as far as the, the whole city is going to be uh, uh, extended with a lot of lampposts, mm -hmm. you are, in fact, uh, reaching the real smart city. <laughs> Okay, uh, please don't leave yet, because I want to see, I, I see if I understand the question correctly in order to answer you. So, if I understand correctly, you want to know how to implement uh, some kind of computer vision or something that allows you to know... Artificial vision. Oh. Oh. Wow. <laughs> Artificial vision. Yeah. Um, well, as you know, there are many sensors uh, already uh, existing in the market, you know. I know exactly what, what's your uh, specific use case, because... I mean, one system cannot do it all. Uh, obviously, using CCTV, you can do a lot of computer vision on top of it. So you could, uh, uh, unfortunately, well, unfortunately, fortunately, uh, in Europe, you also have uh, GDPR, you know. So you would have also, if people go, you have to blur face and everything. But the idea is that, for example, with a camera and other sensors, you could uh, easily know everything that goes around. I mean, but depending then on how high the, the, infra the, the the lamppost is, and all the infrastructure around it. Because, I mean, if you have trees and buildings, you know, a camera wouldn't do of it. Of course, yeah. So you would have to probably place these cameras and all uh, other devices somewhere else. Uh, but there are a lot, to be honest, there are a lot of technological solutions around there. We, I'm not aware of all of them. Um, actually, it's also one of the reasons uh, we are here, to know also what's, uh, what's around. But if you want to have a talk and, uh, and see yeah. how we can help you, please okay. join us. I hope I answered partly your question. I'm, I'm, okay. I know with, without a specific okay. use case, it's, it's quite difficult you know, to, yeah. to answer this in, uh, yeah, in general I, terms. I can explain you more in detail. But in any case, the main, the main issue is how to uh, locate the edge computing uh, on the lamppost, because okay. the cloud computing is not adequate for this kind of application. That's a very, very important issue to resolve, okay? Yes. So yes. I will talk to you later on. Well, we, yeah, but uh, concerning the edge computing, uh, just to tell you that uh, nowadays you have, and we actually have a solution of uh, a lamppost with, with uh, neutral hosts and slots in which you could add an edge computing uh, unit that could do that. Uh, but anyway, let, please, okay. let's thank meet at the booth th and thank uh, you very let's much. talk. I will talk to you later. <laughs> Thank you. Gracias. With no further questions, I want to give a round of applause to Mr. Ricardo Boeta. Go in the middle. Oh, oh, in the middle. City Nervous System. And he will be around and available. Uh, for those of you who did not get a chance to ask a question or were too afraid to, he will be around to take them. All right. Uh, we're going to switch now. Thank you so much, Ricardo to an interview that I'm going to actually do with the mayor of Dublin, Ireland. Let's give him a round of applause. As I prepare him, I will introduce him as they set up the stage. Paul McAuliffe is the councillor, elect, was elected by the Lord Mayor of Dublin at the annual meeting of the Dublin City Council held on Friday, the 7th of June, 2019. So he says he's relatively new, but I don't believe that. <laughs> He was elected to the Dublin City Council in 2009 and was re-elected in 2014 and 2019. He has served as the chairperson of the City Council's Enterprise and Economic Development Committee, and he is a member of the seven-person corporate policy group chaired by the Lord Mayor. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome the Honorable Paul McCullough to the stage. Can you sit here? Here, sit on that one. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> now we're battling with a little background noise behind us because as I've told, we have no roof and no wall. So please let us know if you can't hear us just by raising your hand. So I want to start with a conversation around this. We just heard from Ricardo, I think, about how cities are beginning to think of, uh, through sort of the structure, right? This, this methodology for actually bring smart applications and infrastructure to cities. You're looking at this too in Dublin. So I'd like to tell me why Dublin, why smart, and where you're kind of going with this as an elected yeah, official. It's interesting, the last talk was a city nervous system. Yes. But I think we're a nervous city system. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I think every city is nervous about this too. Yes, yes. Uh, 
Because uh, as you roll out any technology, it creates civic debate. Uh, and as a mayor, uh, you, it's all, uh, politics is all about prioritization, right? right? right. So what is more important to you? What, where does your limited budget go? And what impact does that, does that have? Uh, and so if we talk to everybody in the room here today, they're going to talk, say, smart cities is, is you know, a real top priority for cities. But I imagine if I go to a housing conference next week, they're going to say housing is important and a health conference and so on. So our job as politicians is to balance that, those competing needs. Um, and we're informed by the decision of the electors every five years. Right, right. So... Um, in deploying smart cities, I think that's the first thing that, 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 we, right. need, that we need to think of. So we have, we have a, a great brand in Dublin, uh, Smart Dublin. Uh, we're working across a number of local authorities uh, to try and develop that brand. We're quite lucky in Dublin in that we have a really strong uh, FDI presence right. uh, in, the, in the tech sector and that that's coupled with a really great, innovative um, a startup community. Right. So I think we have a lot of the ingredients. Um, so we have... We've looked at the development of and the rollout of 5G. We've in our smart Docklands area. We have rolled out a, a small cell cluster, uh, and we're in the middle of that pilot phase. Uh, it's it is right in the heart of the Docklands, which is where all the tech companies are. So it's not in a disadvantaged community. It's right where everybody believes it should be. So I'm worried about two things because we're still at review right. stage. Scalability, mm -hmm. so how do we go from this small cluster to a citywide uh, program? Uh, and you have two policy influencers here talking to a whole room of engineers, right? right, right. So all these guys are worrying about how you scale it right. in technology terms, right? I'm worried about how we scale it from a city, di from a city dialogue perspective. Right. So I wanna, I wanna talk about that just for a moment. So in the United States, we have the same kind of conversations, right? There's the uh, development of the small cell infrastructure that's gonna require mu much more densified networks, much more propagation of signals, et cetera. Then there's this conversation about civil society and the applications that will roll off of that and how you get your citizens to understand what's actually going on in this process. What have you done to sort of create less tension <laughs> between the two verticals, between what the technology will require in terms of infrastructure, small cell infrastructure, and what citizens expect their governments to do. Okay, so I think <laughs> one, of the, one of the challenges we found is that working internally, right. uh, the asset owner of the, light, of the lamp pole is our traffic department. Yes, yes. And they're really protective of that uh, for good reasons, right? Because they have their responsibility uh, and they have over time learned what, what they believed uh, the city wants. Right. So they're very protective of it and it has been one of the real challenges that we have. But as you talk about the, the deployment, right. probably for the first time since electrification, we're going to have such a strong physical presence being rolled out right. on streets. And that's going to force Mrs. Murphy or Mrs. Jones <laughs> to say, what's that plastic box right. on, that, uh, on that pole? Uh, what does it do? How is it going to impact me, and why is my city spending money on it? That's right. That's right. And, and I'm not sure any city has really started to have that full-blown conversation with, with, with their citizens. Right, and I think it's important. I'm not sure about how many of you are familiar with 5G infrastructure. I mean, we're literally talking about, in previous 4G iterations, probably macro towers that you would actually put one in this room, and that macro tower could actually do the spread of the type of connectivity that we've all come to expect under mobile. On 5G, we're talking about a tower here, a tower here, a tower here, a tower here. And that, like you said, will be scary to Mrs. Murphy, who's saying, what is my city doing from an architecture standpoint? Is it concern on the beautification side of it? Is it concern on the, the density of these networks? Where do you think citizens are sort of seeing the architecture side of it? And then I want to talk to you about the impacts for citizens. Yeah, so I think there, there's going to be a lot of concerns. Yeah. And Sometimes it's easy for technical people to set those aside right. and say, oh, you know. Th th it's that's, just a pizza box, Yeah, right? that's, a, that's, a, that's a Luddite concern, right. you know, right. absolutely. But as politicians, we have to persuade people yes. on all of our policies. Sometimes we get 90 seconds at a door right. uh, to persuade people that this is a, is a project. So as we roll it out, I believe we, we need to have the conversation around, for example, the ethics of, of, of doing a business. Why aren't we doing it as a public project? Why are we doing it in a partnership? That's the first area of concern. 
the health concerns are there. I believe they're best dealt with at a national level with our, our, our communications regulator and so on. Um, but again, that's a conversation that, need, that needs to happen. And as the third one, as you say, is, is the issue around beautification or, or the public domain. Right. And you will be surprised that even the location of a dog poo bin <laughs> can set off a public meeting in, in, in an area, right? Right, right? And I think the last one then is the value for money issue, yes. right? When I'm living like the Flintstones, <laughs> why are you spending money right. on the Jets? Keep my Flintstone life, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. but they're, they're, people just want, they want a home, they want a job, right. they want to be able to get to work. Right. And so this idea of city FOMO, the fear of missing out, right, is what we're, we're all engaged in mm -hmm. uh, so that we, we're not left behind. Right, right. But we have to persuade people it's worth investing in, it's worth spending on. And my biggest concern, I know you have a lot of yeah, concerns yeah. in this area too, is that the, it's hardest to sell that message to the most disadvantaged of communities. Yes, 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 you know? yes. So uh, my electorate area has one of the highest opiate uses uh, in, in Ireland. We've won the highest levels of public housing. We have a very significant uh, area disadvantage. They don't care about 5G. Right. They just don't care about it. Right. And we have to, we have to persuade them that it's important, right? But also, we have to answer their needs with 5G. It's not about rolling out pizza boxes on, on lampposts. It's about the use cases that will improve their lives. And I yeah. still think we have a long way to go to flesh out those use cases. You know, it's so interesting, because I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm writing this book. And so I'm going to areas in the United States where there's high rates of opioid addiction, where there are seniors that you know, don't drive anymore and really ha are staying bedridden, right? Because they cannot get care. And I want to talk a little bit about this, particularly for those of you that are engineers and others who are interested in this. There is messaging with this. How, what percentage of people in Ireland do you think actually carry one of these around? It, it, it's very high. We have very high uh, proliferation of mobile phones. We talk a lot in Ireland. Yes, yes. <laughs> and I bring that up because in, in the U.S., as with other countries, we're seeing over 90%, yeah. right? And so can we persuade people to see that this device has to be enabled by something? And even treatment for opioid addiction can come from better networks where you can navigate private transactions from the comfort of your home. Or if you don't have a car, you can still get help. Mayor, is that some of the messaging that we should be giving people in terms of this, or yeah, but we're are we coming, missing the boat, you know? We're, we're coming from a legacy yes. where these communities don't trust us to provide housing. Uh -huh. They don't trust us to provide jobs. They don't trust us to solve their, their health needs. Uh, so why would they trust us that 5G is going to be good? Yeah. And so I think we've a, it's, a, it's a really difficult conversation in those areas because commercial companies aren't necessarily going to go to those areas first. Right. So right. We, we're going to have to make a difficult decision about ensuring that the deployment covers all areas. But then when it starts in those areas, we're going to have to persuade those people it was worth forcing these companies to, to, right. do, to do it. And I think the way you do that is the use cases. Yes. Uh, it is, is sparking the imagination of communities and saying, yeah. What can you do? Give them ownership. Help them. And we've, we've done this um, uh, with our beta projects in, in, in Dublin. Is going at challenge them at, at what the issues are in their city and then show them how mm -hmm. use cases can deliver those solutions. That's right. But we have to be careful because over-promising is the worst thing you can do as a politician because three years later somebody else criticize you for overpromising, and you're gone. And you're replaced with a more irresponsible politician who wants to get rid of 5G, right? right? I mean, going back to Ricardo's earlier presentation, how many of you in this room remember the various iterations of technology projects that we were trying to do in cities that somehow along the way didn't, it was a start stop, right? Because we started it, but the funding or the lack of adoption really stopped us from doing that. But I want to go down to the traffic part of it. You said the traffic department is actually the ownership of the polls. <laughs> Uh, we're seeing a lot of segmentation too, right? By who's actually got to be a part of this process to make it successful. How do you suggest that cities actually bring more coordination among agencies to actually ensure that they can roll this out? Because that's another issue. The traffic department is used to doing stuff this way, and now you're asking them to do something differently. Uh, I was interested when Ricardo was talking about technologies using different languages. Yes. Uh, I've sat in rooms with city officials. <laughs> They're in the room. There's no technology. They're speaking different languages to each other, right? So uh, this, is a, this is a silo issue that we, yes. that we have. Uh, 
I'll give you an example. So uh, we have, we're, we're exploring the, the whole area of e-scooters in Dublin, right? Yes. So for climate change, we want modal shift. We want people to use different forms of tra transport to get, out, to get out, out of their cars. Our traffic department is responsible for that. Um, and they, I would say, have a very conservative view on the, on the use of e-scooters in, in, the, in the city. Yes. Why is that? Because that's their job. Uh, yep. Climate change is not their job, right? right? It's the traffic. So I think as, as city leaders, we need to be better at bringing those together. Now, look, that's what we've been doing for centuries. Go back to the medieval time. Right. There was the one guy that everyone spoke to. Why? Because he was bringing different silos right. together. But I think from a technology perspective, we have to make sure that that happens. Right. A a and that we don't have competing technology. That's right. So I'm getting ready to open it up for questions. So I'm giving you a warning that you'll be able to ask Sarah some questions. But I do have something I think that's on the mind of most of us which is what do you believe will be the game-changing application for 5G in cities? You're asking me to predict the next... Yeah, I want you to predict next, it. The next Uber. What do you get? Next... <laughs> right, exactly. Well, we had that, right? 4G birthed ride-sharing and birthed social media. Uh, 5G has the potential to do precision agriculture, uh, more healthcare uh, applications in terms of surgical precision and precision medicine. What do you think for cities, though? will be the game-changing application of 5G. I know I'm putting you on the spot, but no, no, no. all the required well, minds Actually, know. I suppose for us, <laughs> yes. the game-changer has been the dialogue that starts on, on, on social media, right? Yes. So in my view, uh, Facebook is where my community is, and Twitter is where the journalists are, right? Or where the invested policymakers are. Um, and that has had a profound impact on politics. Mm -hmm. um, Lots of security concerns, right, with, 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 with interference and so on. But it has also had a profound impact in the way we act as poli as politicians. Yes. And um, I think the next uh, game changer for me is when we have technology that allows people turn the conversation into action. Oh, so when yes. we bring community development online. So community development is really important in communities. It's what enables change. Mm -hmm. It's youth work. It's uh, education. How does technology provide that platform that, bring, that brings us online? So we're doing lots of, we're doing lots of uh, exploring in that area, but I think that's where the, the game changer will be. I mean, that is so interesting for somebody who's been doing this, like many of you in this room. If you all remember, the game changer, if we would have sat on the stage about 10 years ago, was how to find potholes, right, in your community. The game changer might have been something around putting benefits online. Being able to change the nature of conversation speaks a lot. Because I think, as you mentioned, as we heard in the previous conversation, we don't have the silver bullet on how to get people to adopt technology yeah. the way we think we do. So, and don't forget, politics, yes, democracy, is, is sliding towards this simplistic, non-expert mode at the right. moment, right? And you, you, you're a little bit more familiar with the impact of that in the United States, but I wouldn't underestimate it in Europe. Yes. Populism is on the rise, and, and a feeling of nostalgia for the past and yes. how great it was in the past is being exploited by those on the, on, on the populist right. And we have to make sure that whether it's climate change or rollout of technology, right. that we bring the basic needs of people with us. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't, as I say, there are people out there ready to squash this and say we don't need it. And the public domain is no longer the town hall, right? No. It's no longer in the forum. Yeah. It's no longer in the plaza. It's actually being debated and, and discussed online. Yeah. yeah. Very, very key points. Okay, I want to take questions in our time because we can continue to talk and I will actually hog that time. Go ahead, sir, if you can go up to that microphone. I'm going to actually say we have Nicola Graham from our Smart Cities program here. So if I get a really technical question, I've got to go to, to, go to Nicola. <laughs> no, no problem. Too many engineers in the audience. No problem. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Shiglov Andre. I'm from uh, Moscow uh, Government IT Department and I'm so Smart City Lab. And uh, I have a very special question. I know uh, in Dublin uh, there is a bench of uh, world famous companies, um, Microsoft, Intel, Airbnb, and so called uh, uh, Silicon, uh, uh, Silicon Bench, if my memory serves me right. And uh, how you, as a Lord Mayor, uh, works with this uh, technological company? So, what is the model of working with them? Uh, for example, in development 5G, or do you prefer, for example, local Ireland companies uh, to develop it first and then 
uh, on uh, the second rate, uh, the uh, giant companies like Intel, Microsoft, and so on. So what is the business model of development uh, smart city solution for development 5G, for example? First local companies, and then uh, uh, first international, uh, yeah. international yeah. Yeah. yeah it's well, first of all, because of the way our economy is based, I regard Microsoft and Google as local Irish companies, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I suppose it's the balance of the two. Uh, and what we've done is, is and it, I said it at the very beginning, we have the, this benefit of this large tech sector in Dublin and the leadership that's there, uh, often European-wide wide leadership, and then we've the, 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 the startup clusters uh, that, that, are, that are being really innov innovative. So actually our smart cities team is really good outside of the change of politicians mm -hmm. in creating those relationships. Uh, and so when I, when, I, when I started in June, you know, there's already huge work done with the, with, with the tech companies. And it's done in two ways. I think it's done around mentoring, support, and leadership from the larger, from the larger companies. But then in terms of implementation, the, it's often done with, 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 with the smaller ones. And in all of this, we can't forget public procurement. It's probably one of the biggest issues that cities have yes. in terms of fostering innovation and creativity is that public procurement, particularly European public procurement, is very restrictive. Um, and so sometimes we can be more agile and uh, respond with the smaller companies right. than we can if, it, if, it's a, if it's a larger company. And it also involves that eth ethical concerns yes. from other elected members. So it, it's a balance of both, but I'd say they fall into provision by the startup and uh, leadership and mentoring and facilitation by the, by the larger Right, ones. and I would assume based a follow-up on that question is, the multiplier effect though, with regards to whatever partnership you use, still has an output of jobs as well as the indirect effects of having 5G locally, right? So if your local companies may not be involved, you're still going to generate a number of, you know, we're going to need people to install all of those small cells. Yeah, right? and I think universities are having a role to play as well yes. in, that, in that conversation, they, uh, a lot of research. So uh, as part of the Dense Air project in the, smart, uh, in the Docklands, it, it's unique. First of all, it's, it's sort of a carrier of carriers. It's neutral host, which is really important because, uh, and the last thing is, is that it's connection of research public sector and private sector. Right. So it's those three combinations together. Right. Any other questions? I've got time for one more question. One more question. We've asked them all. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. That's when you actually uh, have a really good conversation. People are like. Most, most town hall meetings we do end with people standing up and walking <laughs> yeah. out. So it's, it's good when so we're So we're actually doing well for the mayor here, right? <laughs> He's like, I actually am in a safe place where people <laughs> like me today. Right? Um, first of all, all your questions, again, the mayor will be around uh, to answer those questions that you have. Uh, we are about to break for a moment, but if you would mind just uh, joining me in welcoming and thanking the mayor again for his conversation. Let's give him a round of applause. Okay. For those of you who may be new joining us, I am Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee. I'm a fellow in the Center for Technology Innovation at the Brookings Institution. We're located in Washington, D.C. Um, and if you miss my formal bio, I work on issues related to legislative and regulatory policies, uh, in particular in the areas of privacy, 5G infrastructure, digital divide and deployment, uh, also in the area of artificial intelligence, particularly algorithmic bias, and I'm writing the book on the U.S. digital divide. So. Enough about me. I want to bring up this next panel who is actually going to speak about a topic that continues on the theme that we've covered since this morning, which is deploying 5G in cities, costs, coverage, and rollout implications. I'm going to first bring up our panelists, and when I call your name, I'll just ask that you take a seat from the far chair to the moderator will be last, okay, to come in. Uh, let me start with Mr. Nicola Fraronato. Uh, he said his name and my name are the same because I'm Nicole and he's Nicola and he is right. <laughs> Let's bring him up to the stage, go out to that far stage. He is over the Torino City Lab as the advisor and deputy mayor of Turin for innovation in smart cities. His 20 years of experience with international business development for Italian SMEs, uh, 10 years of experience with tech and social startups in Ireland, France, the UK, Italy, and currently working on the innovation strategy and action for the city of Turin with the Torino City Lab hat. He's passionate about innovation, smart cities, and entrepreneurship. Let's give him a round of applause. 
He is followed by Mr. Jose Antonio Aranda. He is at uh, Celnex as the Innovation and Prodigy Product Strategy Director in Madrid. In this role, he, which he has worked at since 2018, uh, he is the Innovation and Product Strategy Director. He has worked 12 years in the GSMA, the Global Mobile Trade Association. He's had different roles as the event director of the Mobile World Congress Barcelona, the head of technology for Latin America, or head of technology for Europe. And he's also worked eight years for Vodafone in teams like the institutional relations. Let's give him a round of applause. Our next panelist is Mr. Eldar Faiz Zulin. Come on up, Eldar. He is the head of the Smart City Lab at the Moscow government. He heads that lab, which is division piloting innovative technologies and solutions in the city of Moscow. He contributed into over 30 pilot projects during his time at the department. He has extensive experience in creating, developing, and managing IT projects in the variety of spheres, including real estate, healthcare, education, blockchain, RPA, and many others. Let's give him a round of applause. And they will all be moderated by Ms. Cynthia Curry, who is the Metro Atlanta Chamber's Director of Smart Cities Ecosystem Expansion in Atlanta, Georgia. Cynthia, as a director, helps advance the region's smart city ecosystem, helps companies grow, attracts new business and investments to the region, and promotes and strengthens Atlanta's position as a technology powerhouse. Cynthia drives collaboration between businesses, government, civic, and educational ecosystems to create resilient, equitable, and sustainable communities leveraging technology. Let's bring up Cynthia Curry to the stage as well. <laughs> Cynthia will be our moderator. As I keep saying in all the sessions, write down your questions because at the end of this conversation, we'll have time for some Q&A. Thank you very much. Let's welcome the panel. Thank you so much. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. Welcome, everyone. How's everyone doing? Oh, come on. Good, good. I know it's pre-lunch, so thank you for joining us. Um, I loved hearing all the fascinating information from our previous speakers, and thank you, Nicole, for leading us with great vigor. There's not a lot of people that compete on the energy front, but you've got it covered. So um, this is one of my, my near and dear um, things to my heart. So I have the extreme pleasure of helping build up the 29 county Metro Atlanta Smart Cities ecosystem. So I get to really work a lot with all of our different partners and help create collaboration and, and help them um, make our cities smarter and our whole region smarter. So 5G um, is really an enabler of the city of dreams. You know, we've talked all week about the city of dreams and 5G is going to make that a reality for cities across the world. Um, it's got such a tremendous impact. Uh, GSMA says that by 2035 that there will be 15% of the mobile industry will be 5G. So that's only five years away. And they're saying that there's 1.4 billion connections that are going to be 5G by 2025, which seems astounding. And so 5G, we all know that it is going to um, increase speeds and have low latency, but it's really going to do a lot of other things. It's allowing things like network slicing, where um, each particular device or whatever the, the cause is will have its own way to communicate, because all the different things of the future are going to need different ways to communicate. It's going to be um, support for... <laughs> the massive um, amount of IoT devices that are going to be coming up as we, we grow. You know, um, IoT is such a booming industry, and I think we have no idea what that future is going to bring. So 5G is going to help allow all of that to happen. It's going to really help um, create a lot more security because we'll be to be able to build the security in from the ground up, which is a little bit of a challenge now since we're trying to retrofit a lot of things. Um, but most importantly, really, I think it's going to change the way people live, and I think it's going to change the way people act, and it's going to change business models. And in my world, that's what I hear all the time, is the business models are changing, companies are doing such different things. So um, we're really fortunate in Atlanta to be a 5G city. We've actually, um, Peachtree Corners has just launched a Curiosity Lab that's fully 5G. Um, 
um, testing lab that they're letting companies come in and use free of charge. And it's kind of letting people experiment in a real-time environment with real traffic and real people and real pedestrians and people going to work on what those business models mean and how all these technologies of the future are going to enable us to have a great future. So thank you to FIRA for having us, all of us. We're so thrilled. I've had the pleasure of getting to know FIRA over the past year. Um, we did host the first North American uh, edition of the Smart City Expo in Atlanta this year. So it's been a pleasure getting to know all of them. So thank you, FIRA, for having us. So we're going to have everyone do a presentation. And then afterwards, we're going to have about a 15-minute chat of Q&A. So thank you again for being here. And welcome. We so appreciate you. You You're first. first. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. It's my first time in Smart City Expo, and I'm really happy to be here. For these two days, I've made a lot of connections with great people. I think it's really important for us to stay open-minded and to share our expertise with our global neighbors, because it's really important if we want to build a smart city. Uh, so dear audience, let me, at the beginning of my presentation, ask you two questions. Uh, first question. Who of you wants the 5G appears in your city? Please raise your hand. Really? <laughs> Why are we here? <laughs> uh, uh, I think that amounts will be bigger because you understand the game-changing services. And I think that it was a little example of the human-centric approach that we also use in Moscow when the feedback from the citizens is really important when you test or implement some technology. Uh, OK, the second question. Who of you really knows in details, technically, how the 5G works? Please raise your hand. OK, please, don't put your hands down, please, for a while. The audience, I'd like to applaud and cheer these guys because they will bring us 5G in our cities. Woo -hoo. Uh, so, and it is a little example uh, when technology sometimes not the main thing. Citizens don't need to know exactly how it works in details. Uh, and it is example of Sometimes the main thing is the quality of living and the services that city can provide. So my presentation is less about technical details and more about quality of living and so how the government can support it. Uh, so uh, one of the key tasks of the Moscow government is to increase the quality of living for its citizens. Moscow has been implementing the smart city program since 2010 and the experience shows that uh, the up-to-date infrastructure is crucial for success of innovation implementation. And if we want to, to bring the smart city services to the next new level, uh, the existing infrastructure should be modernized, and the 5G implementing is one of the biggest parts of it. Uh, if we talk about the advantages, they are data speed, they are response time, and the uh, large capacity. And all these advantages will make it possible to introduce the game-changing services in the city life in various markets, such as telemedicine, AR, VR technology, driverless cars, drones, and so on, so on. For example, uh, you can virtually visit the football match sitting in your sofa, and you will receive the same emotions if you will be on the stadium. Ultra-high quality of sound, ultra-high quality of video, and the VR headsets make it possible. So another example you can visit uh, different and discover different cities also and places. You can buy the virtual excursion and to see how the city was looked like in the past and how the city will li look like in the future. It's the, just an examples of entertainment. Uh, also, the 5G provides the possibility to work in one place, in one system for million and million devices, uh, and it accelerates all the systems, all the processes in the communication systems of the city. For example, uh, we can put uh, in one single system a uh, helmet camera, radio station, mobile phones, a medical device, and the operator will receive uh, the data, various data, and can make quick data-proven decisions, and it will save something lives, especially when we talk about the emergency services in the city within rescue team or firefighting teams. Uh, we can talk about these uh, game-changing services for a long time, then experts will explain us how to implement it in the city. But I want to say that uh, 5G brings one more thing. And we believe in Moscow that 5G will facilitate the creation of new business models, will facilitate the creation of new tech companies, new jobs for specialists, and it will all greatly boost the economic potential and the leading role 
of uh, Innovation Center for Moscow. And to make it happen, we need to do a lot of job. And Moscow's Department of Information Technology uh, doing this. Uh, we support and coordinate the market players at the all, every stage of preparation for the launch of the 5G. Uh, four agreements were signed with telecom operators, and nowadays we have five pilot zones in the city. Uh, during the pilot stage, uh, the operators will go through scenarios of interaction between 5G and early stage uh, generation networks, will study the facilities, the opportunities, the functionality, and so on. And we believe that uh, we're going to test uh, even the business cases and even the smart city services. All the investment nowadays come from the business. Uh, additionally to these pilot zones, the Moscow IT department is preparation to launch the 5G demo center. And we'll, it will be uh, open to the major companies as well as startups and research institutes. Because we believe uh, if we want to create and build game-changing services, we need to attract companies and people from different markets such as banking, healthcare, and so on. And only in cooperative work uh, it will happen. Uh, this demo center for 5G will be open also for foreign and Russian companies. Uh, so you can uh, attempt and to use this. Uh, also, we understand that it's a really big job and really uh, big work, not only from the operators or business, also from the government. And instead of these pilot zones and demo centers, uh, we provide the simple uh, way of receiving the documents. Uh, nowadays, if the operator wants to put some sales station in, the, in Moscow, for example, you need it will take you nine or 12 months to receive the documents. And we are going to make it to three months because it's really important. And as you know, Moscow now uh, leads the United States study of the government. And I think that we're going to make one more e-government services. Uh, and it will be really important and helpful uh, for operators to make more and more sales stations because in 5G it's really important to have a lot of amount of this. Uh, so one of the main thing also is the aesthetic criteria uh, because we want to save the historical view of the city and to make this possible we attract a lot of people, also business, citizens, to understand and to design these criteria, uh, which contain the uh, equipment placement, where to put it, and the equipment size, because it's also important to make the, to save the historical view. Uh, so we also understand that it, will, it won't be immediately, it, it's really need to work about this, and we believe that in 2023, 25, it will be the commercial re realize of this technology, and it will bring us uh, real game-changing services that will increase the citizens' lives, and it's our goal because of that we work. So if you want to receive some more information about our activities, I'll be here after this session, or you can go to the uh, stand of Moscow, it's also here, and to receive some information. So let's create new game-changing services using the 5G because technology sometimes is not the main thing. The main thing is the quality of living. Thank you so much. Nice. Thank you. All right. So, um, uh, my first slide will go to explain what we do at, at Segnex. Uh, many of you may not know what we do. Um, uh, we are an infrastructure company. Uh, at the moment, uh, we are present in seven countries. We are in <coughs> Spain, in Italy, in France, in the UK, in Switzerland, in the Netherlands, and in Ireland. And basically what we do is we offer our towers for either broadcasters to convey the TV signal to homes or to the mobile operators to provide coverage to uh, the users. Uh, I have just uh, put a picture there uh, in Barcelona. Uh, one of the uh, uh, towers that we operate, if you look up to the mountains, that big tower, Cocherola, is a, to a tower that we operate. So that's the frame uh, where we work at. And uh, uh, this uh, presentation was about how are we preparing ourselves to figure out a uh, what will come in 5G and uh, to prepare networks to be ready for 5G and the evolution of 4G. 
and uh, as all engineers, we like splitting the big problems into small slices and uh, small pieces. And, I, and in this picture, I wanted to show you how we face within Celnex that migration to 5G. So the first uh, layer is, OK, what do we have uh, in the underground and in the ground itself? So the, the, there's going to need to change fiber. There's go we are going to have new sites. We are going to uh, have new locations. What for? Because uh, when you talk about 5G, everybody says, yes, I'm going to uh, enable the users to have one gigabit per second, and that's a lot. Uh, but that means that in a single tower, you're going to collect a lot of, a lot of traffic from the different users uh, consuming uh, traffic. But that needs to be conveyed to the mobile operator. So uh, for 5G, it is necessary to have fiber to all the towers. So that's the basic one. Second one. With 5G, uh, everybody says, yeah, it's computing uh, data centers. You're going to need to have processing capacity closer to the uh, uh, antennas. Why? Because we are talking about things that happen in milliseconds. We are talking about connected car. We are talking about robotics. We are talking about automation. And all of these will require infrastructure that has to be closer to the antenna. That's why we need uh, new data centers, big data centers. You need edge computing nodes closer to your antennas so the decision is taken very closer to your antennas. We are now deploying in uh, our towers uh, 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 data centers, and we are also deploying cabinets closer to antennas to enable and to facilitate uh, this migration. Second layer. Second layer is how you are going to cover the cities, and you need new uh, uh, outdoor coverage. In terms of having uh, towers updated to 5G, and this is an example of a tower in Switzerland that we have, uh, you need to update also the towers in the rooftops, and uh, you, yeah, that's another example that we have in Paris. Uh, but of course, uh, with the new technology, you have new frequencies, and uh, uh, there's one frequency of 20 gigahertz in Europe, a uh, uh, millimeter wave, uh, that you will require to have more assets. And it was discussed in the different panels that you may need more uh, places where you put antenna, here and here. And we believe that we need to coordinate that implementation. So you, uh, the mobile operator cannot go uh, to the city and say, OK, I'll put here my, my, in this lamppost my antenna, but in this other, it will be operator two, and in this other, operator three. We believe, uh, and because the mobile operators are suffering uh, from the investment that they need to do in new technologies of a neutral host uh, approach, that you have one single place where all the operators can go and put their antennas facilitated by a neutral host. That's uh, basically our, our model. But as well, when you talk about 5G, you talk about things talking. So machine-to-machine -machine communications are Internet of Things. And for that, you also need to prepare your network. You need to also have a specific coverage, a specific network separated uh, to the networks from uh, people that are talking or are uh, watching videos. Uh, following layer. The following layer is, OK, we have covered the city, but how about uh, densification? So one of the main uh, drivers to implement um, 5G is huge volume of traffic. And therefore, you need to start preparing your network that, uh, to have uh, here a lot of people consuming data, uh, recording and sending uh, videos, and all of that experimenting virtual reality. And all of that needs to have antennas and needs to have uh, wider coverage. You need to establish a small boxes, uh, a distributed antenna system in different buildings. And a perfect example is, for instance, in a, a theater, but of course in a football match. When you go to a football match, you are now recording everything. And you want to, wa to send the video, you want to send the picture to your family. What is happening now? is that you go to a stadium, and uh, because of the lack of coverage, you cannot do that. And uh, uh, citizens uh, and, in general, uh, users are willing to have that service. And we have uh, started implemented uh, coverage in stadiums like Milano, like La Roma, Juventus. Recently, uh, Atlético de Madrid, we are discussing with clubs in the UK, in Spain, and because we see that that will be potentially the first use case that the users enjoy in 5G. But as well, uh, we talk about hospitals, and we talk about uh, emissions. Yes, right. Uh, one of the things that, uh, we, when we talk about emissions, everybody gets nervous. But uh, we have to realize that uh, uh, 5G has a, a, a one thing, is that you will have coverage if you require it. 
So you have what, what is called Massive MIMO. That is a technology that if you have a, a, a demand of traffic, the antenna will look at you and uh, give you traffic. But if not, that angle will be empty. So that's a different approach, and that's why we think that's optimal also for uh, e-health and to cover hospitals. Uh, the following layer, once we have covered all of that, is, to, is, is now time to talk about verticals. And, and because in the end, uh, uh, what sustains the model is not the infrastructure, is how the users are uh, using my infrastructure to have services. The plenty of services that we have been tested already, uh, they always say that a technology is implemented first and then the, the, the killer application comes. That's what happened with uh, 4G, and that's what happened with 3G, and that's what happened with all of it. We launched 4G, and then social network came. So the operators will probably launch the service, uh, will expect to create the ecosystem that will deploy that killer application. We are already uh, uh, working on different, uh, as, uh, different verticals. Uh, we think that security will, will be something that benefits from 5G. For instance, what, what about uh, having people uh, uh, using uh, cameras to understand, for instance, in the stadium, whether uh, you recognize everybody and you see that uh, someone in the middle is a terrorist? You want to know that. So that will be enabled by, by 5G, and we are working on that. Or how about if you're uh, using uh, 5G to pilot drones to go to a fire and extinguish it properly so that, and, and have a thermal vision not only in the city but also in the outside in the forest. So that, 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 these are the kind of use cases that we are working on. Also, we are working on use cases related to mobility, uh, use cases related to uh, industry for the zero. For us, one of the uh, uh, most important that will come medium term, I would say probably uh, in five years' time, ten years' time, is autonomous driving. And we are experimenting these already uh, in, in uh, our offices. We have tested the communication between cars when, for instance, an ambulance is coming and when it's uh, one kilometer far that you can still hear, you receive a message saying an ambulance is coming, so you go to a site. But not only on, on that sense, also saving fuel. If you know that that traffic light is going to go red in five seconds, probably you will say, okay, I'm not going, I will deaccelerate and I, I will probably save fuel. Uh, and, and these are the kind of cases that we are working on. Um, uh, happy to uh, explain further. Uh, we have also a booth here. Uh, our uh, headquarters are in Barcelona, so uh, we welcome you in our booth to further discuss any questions that you may have on 5G. Thank you, Jose. Nicola? Thank you very much. Also looking for football matches. Yeah, we can talk. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. So, thank you very much. I think you can hear me. Yes. Is that? Yeah. Now it's working better. Thank you very much for uh, this invitation. My name is uh, Nicola Farronato, and I'm uh, part of the innovation team of the city of Turin, uh, working very close with the deputy mayor for innovation and smart city. It's really exciting, exciting to be here actually today um, because of the title in particular of this session. Uh, that's something that uh, really caught my attention because we are talking about cities that can enable the future. That's a great responsibility and that's a great opportunity. I suppose that the answer of the city of Turin can be condensed in this payoff, the city partner of innovation. That's one of the ways I like to see um, in terms of how we envision ourselves to be enabler of the future. Um, it's not only a technological standpoint, but it's more like which kind of role is the city really having? Is it going to build and develop innovation? Is it going to enable innovation, so to connect the dots? Or is it going just to stand still because innovation is going to happen in any case? Mm -hmm. So our idea is we want to be a partner of innovation, which means at least two things. In one way, be a smart connector and enabler of innovation. So do whatever we can to lower down barriers to make innovation within our city. On the other hand also, try to leverage 
open innovation mindset, open innovation point of view to make demand and offer of innovation meeting each other and therefore connected. So, oops. First of all, I would like to give you a couple of uh, numbers, a little bit of a background, a little bit of an idea about Turin. So Turin is a city northwest of Italy, a little bit less than one million people living there. We have about 10% of the people studying there, uh, thanks to two very high-ranked uh, uh, education organizations like uh, University of Turin and Polytechnic of Turin. We have about 330 startups at the, at the minute, and we have about 75,000 companies. Most of them are SMEs. What's interesting about that? The interest about that, which I'm, I'm trying to sum up in this slide, is that we are trying to go a little bit beyond of the concept of smart city. And the title I gave to this slide, Torino Smart Cities, so it's plural, because the vision of the city is within the peri perimeter of the city to think about different smart cities embedded into the municipality. What you see here in the different dots are a number of areas that we are trying to focus as verticals for experimentation to drive the city to be smarter and smarter. We're talking about areas like aerospace, we're talking about areas like drones, like the city of health, the health district, the industry 4.0, thanks to the tradition of the, the region and the city as heritage, and of course some science district. Within the cities, so if you imagine these smart cities as a number of dots, there is an interesting concept that we like to use in this case. So trying to interpolate those dots with a line, and that's what we have called the innovation mile. The innovation mile is a very key line within the city, which basically stands for we are trying to connect, to interpolate those smart cities thanks to a connection, a unique policy, an enabling of innovation happening in the city, both incremental innovation and radical innovation, trying to put together all the ingredients to make the city smarter and smarter. First of all, the aim we have started from is trying to look for new models of innovation, new models of technology, able to substitute, so to replace the current ones, in a way trying to look for the next big thing, the next paradigm. So our job today is, first of all, transform this aim into our claim. I'm playing a little bit w with words here, but the fact is trying to be good in making the environment and the Turin city, urban ecosystem, of interest, appealing, able to attract innovators coming from Italy, coming from Europe, coming from all over the world, simply looking at these three points, which are very close to the startup dictionary. So first of all, I test, then I adopt, and then I try to scale it up. The way the initiative, the action we are using to do this is called Torino City Lab. Torino City Lab has, uh, is one year old and is the policy, the innovation policy of the city. An open innovation platform willing to accelerate and to enable innovation happening in town. I want to just send to you this video, and I hope we can have some audio, just to introduce Torino City Lab in one of the most important cities for Italy in terms of heritage, in terms of production, manufacturing, and of course in terms of innovation. So while this video is going, what we are trying to do is put the different souls of the city at the service for innovation. And as municipality, our role is trying to low down barriers preventing innovation to happen. We are not inventing or bringing innovation in place, but we want to try to make as smooth 
as lean as possible. And this is a process, of course, not an event. You can imagine public sector, sector being attractive and of appeal to, uh, to private innovators. Um, a couple of examples to, uh, uh, to speak about. First, of course, we have been able, in about one year of work, to aggregate some 50 different players, nationals, internationals, with different vocation from research to experimentation to finance to uh, uh, startups. And the idea is to be able to build an ecosystem facilitated by the municipality. A couple of uh, examples and use cases I would like to bring are connected to the future of mobility. Turin is really connected to future of mobility. And one of the action we have been able to, to get and to achieve is um, 35 kilometers of urban circuit already equipped in terms of authorization and partially in terms of equipment and infrastructure, of course 5G included, for autonomous driving and testing. There is quite a lot uh, uh, we are looking at in terms of experimentation. Just a few days ago, we have got 5GAA, one of the most important global consortium, making the conference in Turin and enabling real-time testings of new technologies powered by 5G for autonomous driving. There is another very interesting angle about the city, which is about drones. So air mobility is certainly an area we love, is certainly an area we want to uh, make happen. And uh, last thing is, we, uh, the most important event for the city is San Giovanni, 24th of June, is the patron of the city. We are willing to make tradition meeting innovation, using this event to leverage new technologies, meeting with the popular um, ideas of innovation. Uh, a lot to say, I hope in some questions we will have the chance to explain further. Thank you very much for your attention and sorry for getting a few seconds more. You did well, you did well. Thank you so much, that's fascinating. I know that we could sit up here all day. We sadly only have 15 minutes to dive into all this amazing information. Um, you know, there were a couple of themes that I heard, innovation being one of them. So let's talk a little bit about how 5G enables innovation in your space. I mean, I know in Atlanta, we're fortunate. We have 16 of the Fortune 500 companies headquartered in our city, and it's been a big um, trend for uh, all of them to open up innovation centers. And so they're all gathered around Tech Square and Georgia Tech um, opening innovation centers. And most of the things they're working on are around IoT, smart cities, and they have um, you know, a great need for 5G in the future. So y'all talk a little bit about what that's enabled for your city and how important it is. Who wants to start? I'm happy to start. looks like he wants to start. Please. <laughs> so I agree with you that um, uh, 5G brings an opportunity on entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it brings an opportunity, as I mentioned before, to create use cases, to uh, define what could be the future uh, using that technology. And uh, 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 that innovation brings as well the possibility of creating an ecosystem, mm -hmm. uh, creating uh, some sort of hubs, some sort of labs, that is the incubator of the new services and the future of the new services. And also the future of the jobs itself. Uh, they, they say that uh, there is a huge percentage of the jobs that will happen in the next 15 years that we already don't know mm -hmm. about. And, and that's something that uh, brings also the, the technology. But not only for kids that uh, they are currently studying, uh, also for uh, employment uh, uh, will bring new possibilities to a city, uh, and, and also sometimes you, you, uh, when you talk about technology, they always say, yeah, but uh, technology is going to destroy jobs. Mm -hmm. I strongly believe that there is an opportunity of upskilling, and it's an opportunity to get benefit from training to uh, jobs that needs to be updated. 
But at the same time, uh, I really think that the, the, the cities will benefit from all these use cases that we have been discussing, uh, and the administration itself, because uh, uh, the mobility will enable to be faster, but also how about if the mobility is electronic and we go to the e-administration, then you will avoid queues, having to go uh, to do a paperwork, uh, um, so we will make the, the, the cities greener. Greeners in terms of, because you will also have not only that mobility that uh, you will have, transport that will uh, save fuels, and et cetera, but also about home working. So why go into a place to work if you have all the capacity uh, and the capabilities to enable that to happen from your house? And uh, uh, also uh, the possibility of having a, a cities more efficient in terms of if I'm able to have sensors all over the place, I will probably save a lot. I mean, I, I was talking with and uh, talking about agriculture. How about if you uh, know a specific, if you have a vineyard, you have vines, and you know when to water each vine, you probably will save a lot of uh, water or electricity. How about if you know that that road uh, is not going to be transit, and therefore you uh, put the lighter a little bit lower? So in general, what I think is that. Uh, uh, the, these technologies uh, will only make the, the cities more inclusive and not more inclusive when you talk about uh, handicapped people or, yes, you may have systems to guide blind people, but also uh, uh, basically uh, people that may not have uh, resources. And we talk about this, yep. uh, about uh, digitalization, about how to bring technology to everybody. And I think the, the 5G is an opportunity to democratize uh, technology. Agreed, and we talked a little bit about the workforce building backstage, and innovation will definitely help build that workforce of the future. Do you want to talk a little bit? Well, I think uh, you have covered already a lot of the topic, <laughs> actually. <laughs> um, just a couple of remarks on my side. Uh, um, just a few, years, uh, a few days ago in Turin, we have launched um, uh, a new partnership, actually, to be the first 5G um, uh, equipped city when we talk about 5G well deployed and enabling a number of other technologies uh, to happen on top of it and the number of other breakthrough most probably to happen on top. Um, not only when we talk about 5G we're talking about another order of magnitude of data and um, we I think we are all aware that data are sort of the new oil of the digital economy uh, at the step we are. So I suppose that again, um, technology is a common factor for all the cities enabling the future. Right. It's very important the role of the city. So which is the decision where, in which role do you want to play into this transformation happening? It's not just a digital transformation because uh, we could speak about anything enabled by 5G. Um, it's probably something that we all think is just step one, uh, the step one of a, of a new revolution happening in the cities, bringing the city, the smart city of today to the new uh, edition of the smart city in mm -hmm. a way. So as Turin, as municipality, uh, I think that on our side it's quite clear the vocation of the city to make everything possible, trying to balance the interest of the citizens and the business, because both are very critical elements of the equation, uh, of the smart city equation, I would say. Um, and certainly, um, as a first mover in Italy, with this kind of uh, strong address, um, we definitely would like not only to advance 5G adoption, but I think also to attract experimentation uh, based on 5G um, using the platform of Torino City Lab as enabler. Yeah, and city support and municipality support is so key. So I loved learning more about what y'all are doing. I mean, it's almost table stakes at this point that you have the support of your city and your municipality. And if you don't have that innovation of the future, you know, your, your city won't be able to grow. So what are your thoughts on that? Yep. Yeah, um, as I said, I think that the two main things that will bring the 5G, first of all, it's a game changing services. If we're talking not about the technology, but about the quality of the living and the, uh, the boost for economical potential. Because we do believe that new technologies, uh, 5G is like an infrastructure that will provide appearance of AI products, blockchain products, and so on, so on, driverless cars. And this will also uh, make possible to create new jobs, as you also said, right. 
and so on and so on. Uh, and we believe that as a city, as a government, we need to give them freedom to business and to citizens to discuss it between themselves because we just need to make the ecosystem where these products can grow and just, in, just help to happen this. And so uh, it's one of our goals and the Smart City Lab that works in Moscow also testing not just only 5G but also in other technologies and it's really interesting to see how these uh, new products can solve the city problems and they really accelerate and increase uh, all the process within the city. I think that's great. And we've all hit on it a little bit, but I mean, I think what we're saying is that 5G and smart cities in general can be used to really attract um, new investment and new businesses and new jobs to our cities at the end of the day. And I work in the economic development uh, department at, at Metro Atlanta Chamber, so that is one of the main reasons that I help facilitate that in the area as well, is we're trying to attract those new companies and that new talent of the future. So why don't each of you talk a little bit about the role that plays and what kind of things that you think adopting this new technology and adopting the innovation can have. And we only have five minutes, so spread it out. Just a quick comment on this. Um, as an Italian, and uh, as uh, uh, working for an Italian municipality, I think that there is an interesting angle talking about uh, a brain drain. Uh, so in Italy, yeah. we have a high, let's say, percentage of brain drain, for example. So I like to think that 5G and the smart city evolution are capable of creating the conditions for some uh, brain gain. So trying to leverage the fact that the city becomes a new field for innovation, not, not just incremental innovation, but sometimes forefront innovation, um, experimentation in a urban context. Um, and if we combine this with the fact that um, uh, macroeconomic research are telling us that uh, in few decades or in few years' time, mm -hmm. uh, majority of population will live in cities, so there will be a sort of, uh, um, let's say, fighting um, from city to city to attract the best resources, yes, the best talent, be. the best skills. Yes. So probably the smart city will be a platform, a ground for this kind of uh, exchange. So ideally, what I, what I uh, really like to think for the future is rather than uh, you're just a citizen, of a smart city, that there is a circulation of resources. Yes. So you can move f from a smart city to another, bringing your value and getting the platform to enable innovation. Yeah, you're a participant. And you're right about the urbanization. I mean, uh, UN predicts that almost 70% of the whole world's population is going to live in a city by 2050. So they have to do more with less. So tell us a little bit about what you think it will yeah, track. Yeah, we, we also think about this. We, we call this the social capital. That yes. is really important. And I think that um, we can see the city, for example, uh, not just a smart city, as city as a service or city as a product. And if we will provide our services for the citizens in the best way, for example, looking for other cities and so on, I think that the people will decide themselves where to go, where they will receive more opportunities, where they will receive uh, more uh, services, as I said, and so on, so on. I think that, yes, uh, it will be the free decision of the population, of the citizens, where they would like to live. And our side is to make the services and all things that around them, the city, just the best as a service, as a product. And so I think that people will decide themselves. So Agreed. Do you want to chat on that a little? Do you have anything to add? Yes. Um, uh, we are present in, in uh, seven countries, and we really see that innovation uh, drive talent. Uh, but as well, uh, when you drive talent, you, you, you drive a uh, ecosystem. You, you, you start creating uh, startups. Uh, and the startups bring investment. And the investment uh, goes to the benefit of the community, the benefit of big companies. The companies wants to have presence there. And all of that makes the city attractive themselves, and it was mentioned, uh, and, and uh, people will want to live in your city. And people will like to uh, be at your city. Uh, but also the kids. Kids will uh, l start liking to be more entrepreneur, or even uh, what we, th we, we see as well is that uh, we start having a little bit of um, 
uh, lack of uh, resources uh, because uh, kids don't want to start in, uh, study engineers. And if you talk about women, it's even worse. Uh, we are not able to attract women uh, to technology, but if they leave it, if they see it in their own city, uh, that's an opportunity as well for the city to uh, grow in future. Uh, and also, it's an opportunity to do trials, and uh, yes. th these trials brings prototypes and brings this event, for instance. Right. This event uh, br brings wealth, and we have already uh, been talking about this, and all of this uh, is for the benefit of that, that trial, end up in a service, in a product for the benefit of the citizen. And the benefit of the citizen will be that that will improve the quality of life of that person or, or that community. So I really think that innovation will improve uh, and 5G the, the quality of living. I agree. I like the brain gain analogy. I mean, that's with uh, innovation happening within the ecosystem and talent attraction, which is everyone's number one uh, challenge. Um, we, I like the citizen focused. Um, you know, we talk a lot about inclusion and equity and making sure, um, and Nicole mentioned it earlier, that we're not making the digital divide larger, that we're trying to really make it smaller and make sure it's for everyone. So I think this is um, just a wonderful, fascinating conversation. And I could stay up here all day but we can't. Um, I do want to thank each one of you so much for your thoughts. It's thank been you. such a pleasure chatting with you and uh, having this conversation. And again, thanks to FIRA. And a quick plug, I mentioned that we have uh, the North American edition of this in Atlanta. So um, it's happening in June in Atlanta, and it's this conference. So if you are interested in going, our booth is right outside at 207. We've got some flyers with discount codes. So Big, big thanks to the panel and big thanks to FIRA for doing this wonderful conference. Oh, they didn't say we did. We're on zero, but we're happy to. It's up to you. Nicole yeah. is allowing one question. Who wants to ask a question? Okay. Oh, back. come on up. Come on up. He's I'll in cut the back. Time down just so we, can get we got a reprive. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Hello. how are you? Henrik Wikström. I'm fine, thank you. Good. Uh, there have been no, not so much talk about the implications. And I mean, about what? There, uh, there haven't been so much That's talk right. about the implications with 5G. I mean, um, uh, <laughs> I'm about to swear in church, I think. <laughs> 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 no, but I mean, the, the possibilities with 5G, there's no questions that it's incredible uh, possibilities with 5G. But, I mean, I've been hearing a lot about health-related problems related to 5G, uh, where the, the, the opposition against 5G says that uh, it's bad for your health, and uh, the one who are pro 5G says that, no, 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 that's nonsense. And, and what I can see is that both sides is thinking that they're pointing at facts, that what they're claiming is true, but really, who? Who should we listen to? I mean, what, what, is, what is right in this? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll take a quick stab. I mean, I think the future is unknown. It's innovation. I mean, you mentioned it. There's going to be a lot of failure. You know, innovation is all about failing and not being afraid to try and fail. So um, no one really has the crystal bottle to tell the future. But there was an example that Elder made um, in regards to health, that when we have connected and intelligent traffic systems, they can communicate with ambulances that are going, and all the lights will turn green for them, and they can get someone to a um, hospital that much quicker. Um, we've got an application in Atlanta called Shot Spotter, and it has acoustic sensors that can detect a gunshot from five miles away and then automatically contact the authorities. It's a, uh, you know, what kind of gun it is, where it is, and we can have emergency response people right on the spot immediately instead of them maybe not being found ever and passing away. So I don't want to take all the time and I could go forever, but the future is unknown. But I think it's going to be both. I mean, all things have a little good and bad in them. That's my thought. Do y'all want to, anybody else want to tackle that? I would say th this is a question that is always raised uh, 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 for the mobile industry. 
the reality is that uh, the, the transmission that the mobile operators and the broadcasters do, uh, they have to respect certain thresholds, and, and uh, all the transmissions at the moment uh, respect that thresholds. Even there are countries like in Italy, there are countries like in Switzerland, that that threshold is one-tenth of, of the recommendation of uh, the, the World Health or, uh, Organization, and the mobile operators ha have to abide for this, and uh, still you, st you keep on having uh, service. One of the things that I mentioned before is uh, that, that possibility of uh, 5G uh, to be able to be intelligent to divert a, a beam just to you. That will also decrease the amount of exposure to the rest. So I, I really think that uh, it's true that uh, when you move to 5G, you move to the millimeter wave, and, and that's something that uh, you need, we need to look at. Uh, but uh, the mobile operators and the, the tech industry, but also the regulators, are always uh, vigilant for the benefit of the, of the citizens, and uh, they will watch for, to make sure that all those thresholds are uh, fully co uh, completed. Anybody Real quickly? Very quick. 30 uh, seconds. I think, I think, first of all, this question is not new. Right. So any breakthrough innovation goes through a due diligence, maximizing the opportunity, minimizing the downsides. And again, probably it's about citizens and businesses right. because they are the key elements of the equation. Right. So I can't take up any more time or else they're going to kick me out and not invite me back again. <laughs> but I think your question Thank is you. very, very helpful. We're battling that as well, as Cynthia said. I think the question for the health issue is, what are the trade-offs in the technology? And as regulators look at this technology, the extent to which, and I know we have this in the United States, regulators will continue to do their due diligence to ensure that these technologies do not impact uh, citizens. We did it with the garage door opener, we did it with the baby monitor, we've done it with the microwave, and hopefully we'll do it with 5G. Yeah. Um, and so it's a process. Yeah. I want to say thank you to this panel. Let's give them a round of applause. I want to echo what Cynthia actually mentioned in terms of FIRA. Let's give them a round of applause for actually putting this together. <laughs> to the previous speakers as well, I know I stand between all of you in lunch, but I do want to leave you with one tidbit before I take myself and sit down. This is going to be an organic process, my friends. This whole, uh, uh, by the raise of hands of people who are exposed to 5G, there's a technical uh, line of work that we have to continue to look at. I'm very impressed by the innovation centers that are popping up all across the world. There is a consumer education aspect that we have to look at. How are civil society actors going to be impacted by the new infrastructure as well as the applications that actually ride up those networks? And the mayor indicated that adoption is not always easy. And so that is also going to be a process. And I think that there's a global coherence around this technology that we didn't get a chance to discuss. What does this look like in terms of international governance, cooperation, uh, innovation, et cetera? The bottom line is the train has left the station. And so as we move forward in this next G, went from OG, no G, to 5G, the question becomes is how are we going to harness it for the public good? And so again, as you leave this conversation, keep thinking about that. It's not just about smart cities in comparison to a city that is not so intelligent. It's about a smart city that moves people away from an analog thinking and economy that doesn't generate the benefits that we're going to see in any evolution of layer technology. So with that, thank you again for your time and coming with us for this last two hours to partake in this conversation. And let's continue the dialogue online. <laughs> thank you again. <laughs>